my name is Patrick Simpson. I was born and raised in Cordova, Alaska, uh, which is on the eastern end of the Prince William Sound. I'm a fourth generation Alaskan. My great grandparents came up as colonists in the Matsu Valley in the 30s. My grandmother was the first graduating class of Palmer High School in 1939. My father graduated from West High in 1958. Um, I graduated from Diamond in 1980. So really uh, nice to be here. I am a serial entrepreneur. What I do is I look for opportunities. And, and what that means is where there's uh, problems and there's no solutions right now. And then I see, I think to myself, can I find ways to solve those problems and can the solution make money? So a part of uh, an entrepreneur's um, objective is to generate some revenue. Well, then I started learning more and more about the problems I'm going to talk to you about, with this, which is plastic ocean waste. And as a fisherman's son, I, my father's a fisherman and I was born and raised fishing, uh, I would be a fisherman probably if I didn't get so darn seasick, but I do. So I, I decided to get an engineering degree instead. Um, but I grew up on the Prince William Sound and I, I beach combed on those beaches and I saw those beaches and got an opportunity to see just how gorgeous of an area that is. And now if you go back, a lot of those same beaches are covered with plastic. And so I'm interested in ways in which we can maybe combat that problem. So let me tell you a little bit about this problem. So first, I'd like you to see, up here of course is Alaska in the upper right. Um, I think probably a great portion of our plastic ocean waste comes from the eastern, uh, from the um, Asia Pacific Island, or nations, excuse me. So this is Thailand. Here you see a river in the Philippines. Here you are in Indonesia, again another river. And what happens is the solid waste processes don't exist. Their waste management practices, they dump it into a river or a stream or on the coastline and then magic happens. Well, the magic that happens is that when you get a monsoon or a high rain condition, all of this waste it's flushed out into the ocean. And if you look at the top here, China, they're one of the worst. Of the 10 worst countries in the world that are polluting the oceans in general, six of them are in this area, and these are five of those six. So if you look at the, the way in which Alaska is configured, over here are those countries. And they're flushing all this waste into the ocean. And then it's getting picked up by the Kuroshio Current and pulled all the way across the North Pacific. And then at this point, it bifurcates. It splits. And part of it goes up north and becomes part of the Alaska Current. And then it gets deposited along our beaches. So this is from NOAA in 2012, 14, 10, 12, and 13, I think it was, they flew all these beaches and they marked them to indicate how much marine debris they saw. Red is the worst, yellow, not so bad, blue, or hardly any. And so they did these aerial surveys and you can quickly see that this Alaska current comes up and swirls along the Gulf of Alaska and anything that's sticking out, this is Kayak Island and this is Montague Island, and this, this right here, that's Cordova, that's where I was born and raised. That's the Prince William Sound. We are over here. This is uh, the Cook Inlet, and then we're right in this area here in Kenai. So kind of orient ourselves. So I decided um, I'd like to see the kayak island firsthand. So I uh, got a local pilot to fly me out from Cordova to Kayak Island. And this is what I saw. Now, you'd look at that and you go, oh, it looks like just a bunch of trees. But just standing in one spot, and if you look really closely, right there's a buoy, right there's a buoy, that's a jug, there's two water bottles and styrofoam. This is one perspective looking at this from one spot. If I walked up and stood over the top, you see five times more. And this is 18 miles up and down this beach. 
The last time this beach was cleaned was 2014. It was tsunami money from the Japanese tsunami. Japan sent a bunch of money over to help clean up our beaches. They pulled 100 tons of marine debris off of this beach. And that was the last time they did it. We just don't do this enough. And a lot of what you see is plastic waste. So I started thinking about where there was gaps in this. One of them is collection. I think that's kind of obvious from this. But then once we collect it, what do we do with it? And this is where I started thinking about if we could find something to do with the plastic ocean waste that comes off the beaches, and that could act as a motivator, then potentially we could get more people to pull plastic off the beaches, thinking of it more as a resource and less as trash. So if we just pull it off the beach and take it to the local landfill, I think we're just moving the problem from one spot to another. Granted, I don't want it on our beaches. The reason I don't want it on our beaches is because big plastic becomes little plastic. It becomes microplastic. And those microplastics are mo making their way into our food web. So there was a Dr. Padula. Um, she got her PhD thesis at the University of Alaska. And what she did was uh, necrocops, necro, I think, necro? Necropsy. Necropsy, thank you. Necropsy, all of the birds that she found on the beaches in Bering, the Bering Sea. You actually have a seabird biologist in our midst. Sarah Youngren, stand up. <laughs> Hi, Sarah. So Sarah actually necropsies seabirds in um, Iktak Island and in St. George, the Pribilofs, Hawaii. Hawaii. OK, so that's where she, but she studies seabirds in Alaska and in the Hawaiian Atoll. And she makes plas earrings out of the plastic that she finds in their well, mostly on the beach, but you know what I mean. Um, and she's our, our local talent when it comes to being a scientist who, who studies these problems and is, and is learning a lot about just how plastic is everywhere in their, in their bellies and their bloodstreams. And, and that's, that was, she, she stole my thunder. It's everywhere. <laughs> and, and you firsthand have probably seen this. You, you probably know Dr. Padula. Um, and they, they found, without exception, plastics in every one of the birds that they necropsied from the Bering Sea. And it was in the muscle tissue, and it was, some of them it was inside their stomachs. Um, so it, it's a bit like a canary in a coal mine, in my, my thinking, that the, the birds are we're seeing it now, but what's going to come pretty soon after this is our, our seafood and our wildlife. Our, and in particular, I'm worried about salmon and ground fish. So what would the impact of that be if we had a lot of plastic found in the ground fish, the seafood industry for Alaska? So I'm trying to engage the seafood industry in that conversation because they have a lot to lose. We all do if one third of our economic stool is broken because of plastic. Um, so what I did was I, I'm very successful in the Small Business Innovation Research Program. SBIR stands for Small Business Innovation Research. And this is a, 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 if you are interested in this program, sbir.gov. There's 13 agencies that provide funding, and uh, they focus on different aspects depending on their mission, and then the EPA focuses on issues such as this. So I propose to build a mobile plastic ocean waste recycler, where what I would do is the plastics that are collected off the beach would be, would be brought in, and then we could turn that into something useful, in this case, recycled plastic lumber. So I got a feasibility award in uh, March of 2021. Uh, that project lasted six months, ended on August 31st. I did outreach. I collected some marine debris. I developed a little lab. I did some testing. Um, I developed a business plan and submitted all that and said, um, I'd like to do a pilot study. And it's a two-phase program, and you compete for each phase. And I was awarded the phase two in January of this year. So now I'm able, in phase two, to build this system and demonstrate it. And the main concept here is instead of taking all of this plastic that we're collecting and centralizing it at one processing facility, which is the hub and spoke model, where the hub is where all the processing is done and the spokes is where everything comes in, that works wonderfully if you've got a road system like you do in the lower 48. We don't. We do in this area, of course, but the majority of our communities are coastal or inland, and they have no roads. So what I focused on was instead of us taking the plastics to the processing, I'm taking the processing to the plastic. So we would stockpile the plastics in communities, take our mobile plastic waste recycler to the community, convert that plastic into something useful, 
leave that thing behind, in this case recycled plastic lumber, and then move the processing to the next, facility, next city. And so, say for example, we, we had a system like that here, we could do Homer, Kenai, Soldatna, Seward, Palmer, and Anchorage. We could do that over and over again, all year long. Then if we had one in the southeast, we could do Yakutat, Sitka, Haines, Huna, uh, Wrangell, Petersburg, and, and Ketchikan, and then swing back up and do it all over again. And, and this is very practical. And it, if you can do it in that fashion, it becomes also very feasible. So here's what I'm doing with this recycled plastic lumber program, is I'm taking ones, twos, fours, and fives, excuse me, twos, fours, and fives, and then the other category, this is the resin chart you've probably seen many times. The seven is other. That's like, oh, we didn't have time to do all of them, so we just threw it in other. So our nylon fish nets, for example, is another. So this is, this is where I'm pulling nets from. And that can be made into recycled plastic lumber. And this is what EPA is funding me to do. Here's how you do that. So the, the first step in the process is you take the material and you grind it down into pellet-sized pieces. So there's lots of different ways to grind, but the, the majority of them is just a big, huge shearing machine. So with, I'm not going to show you the grinder. That's pretty straightforward. But here's where the magic happens. So then the ground material goes into a feed hopper, and there's this auger that is heated. So these heaters are on either side of the barrel of the auger. And what the auger does is it moves the material from a solid and it goes through a transition to the point where down here it's molten plastic. And then that molten plastic is squeezed into different shapes. So you can squeeze it into tubes, into sheets, into parts, or in the case of what we're trying to do, lumber. So I want to show you what that looks like. But I, I had an opportunity to walk around earlier and pass out some of these. And if you didn't get them, I'm going to leave the rest on the table over here. But this is the end we cut off of a 2x6. So we, have, we can make 8-foot 2x6s out of plastic, or 4x4s, or 2x4s. So this is what we're doing now. This machine I had built and delivered, oops, wrong one, built and delivered, where we take these plastics and we run them through this machine right here. This is that extruder. So what I was showing you in a cartoon, this is the actual version of that. And then back here, this big thing, that's our grinder. And that all sits inside of a 53-foot trailer. So that 53-foot trailer can be moved anywhere where there's a road system. And if we can get it onto a barge, we can move it anywhere in Alaska. And here's some recycled plastic lumber that we made. Here's Jerry. He works with me. He's got a chop saw and he's just cutting them to eight foot even lengths and the ends of those you're holding in your hands. So that, those literally came out of this stack of lumber right here. And that system was put together and demonstrated for the first time in Palmer week before last. So it's relatively new. We just stood this up. So the pilot demonstration for this, we're processing now in Palmer and we're collecting in Seward. So here's the Seward Marine Industrial Complex. We're using plastics from marine debris cleanup with the Resur Resurrection Bay Conservation Alliance. We're working with Sustainable Seward and Lori Landstrom's group. And we've got a, a couple dumpsters that have uh, super sacks inside of them. And I go down periodically and empty those out, bring them over to the SMIC. We're also working with the Kenai Peninsula Borough. They have a, a recycling program. And they bring over their roll off and dump it. And we repackage it into su super sacks. So that's, that's my truck. That's a bunch of plastic. That's about five hours worth of repackaging into 26 super sacks. And then um, cruise ships also bale up their plastics, and they give that to the Kenai Peninsula Borough. So we, will bring, we bring those bales over. And here you can see where we're storing it at the Seward Marine Industrial Complex. So you can see in this picture. Here's the uh, bales. Um, these are super sacks. And yes, I'm the proud owner of a garbage truck. <clears throat> I'm also uh, stockpiling plastics in Palmer. This is a panoramic shot, thanks to the iPhone. Um, I have, I have uh, 180 super sacks in Seward and somewhere in the neighborhood of 250 here in Palmer. 
But the difference is in Palmer, I'm processing predominantly HDPE pipe thread protectors, which I'll talk to you about here in a second. So this is what the system looks like now. It's fully stood up. It's a generator, a conveyor, both mobile, just pulling behind a vehicle. And then that magic happens inside of here, and there's the super sacks. So our first tests were done with thread protectors. So every piece of pipe that goes up to the north slope has these plastic thread protectors they put on both ends. And so you can see them here in this picture. This is one end, and this is the uh, one that they screw in, and there's one that goes on the outside. And so those thread protectors, when they're done, um, they usually try to throw them away or donate them or give them to somebody. They're giving them to me. I take and grind those up, and they go into that bin on the extruder. Here's that line. And then they go into a form. So this form here is a piece of metal. We extrude into that we extrude into that piece of metal, and out comes a two by four after it cools. Here's uh, somebody from Triveras holding up the two by four, and there's a stack of some recycled plastic lumber we built. So I'm very proud of this step. I think, to the best of my knowledge, this is the first time anybody has taken and recycled plastic and converted it into something like recycled plastic.